Welcome back. In this video, I'm gonna give you 10 tips on how to balance your blood sugar. Now, if you've been watching the last few videos in this blood sugar and autoimmune disease series, you will have learned how blood sugar fluctuations are really bad for autoimmune disease. You will have learned how to know if your own blood sugars are fluctuating wildly and maybe causing you issues. And you may have watched my own video where I talked about wearing a CGM or a continuous glucose monitor and all of the information and uh, fascinating insights I've learned from that. So if you haven't watched those, I would recommend going to see those at some point in time because you would learn a lot. But in this video, I'm gonna focus on these tips that you can use that are actionable and things that will just really help to balance your blood sugar so they're not doing this all day long and staying more stable with just a few little blips and things like that, which will be so much better for your autoimmune disease and your health overall. Before I get into this, I do wanna make the disclaimer that I am not a doctor, medical professional, or dietitian or anything like that. So before making any like major changes to your diet or anything like that, you may wanna uh, consult with one of them just to make sure that you're doing everything properly, especially if you do already have a diagnosed metabolic issue like diabetes. And I also want to note that doing these kind of things is not to replace doing an anti-inflammatory diet like autoimmune paleo or paleo or something like that to really uncover your food intolerances and to help leaky gut and all of those things. This is to be done in conjunction with that or after that to really work on long-term healing uh, beyond maybe an elimination diet. But it is really important to work together on that and not necessarily just replace doing a diet like that with just blood sugar control. Tip number one, avoid refined sugar and highly processed carbs as much as possible. Now you probably already know this, and if you're actively trying to heal your autoimmune disease via diet, you may even scoff at this and say, not me. But let me warn you that once you feel great again and don't have the symptoms of your disease dragging you down each and every day, you may start to experiment with having these, or maybe be in a situation where there isn't much else available, or just generally go back to what you knew prior to healing. Don't automatically assume you'll never touch it again because you never know what the future holds. However, this also includes things like gluten-free, organic, vegan, AIP, and paleo packaged goods. Sometimes these can be even worse than their conventional counterparts because oftentimes more sugar is needed to make them taste good. And just because something is grain-free doesn't mean it's not made with a starch like tapioca or cassava or arrowroot, etc. And these can be hard on blood sugar. It really pays to read labels and don't overdo any of these. Just don't get caught up in the trap of, oh, it's organic and gluten-free and in the uber fancy health food store, therefore it must be healthy and I can eat as much of it as I want. Read the labels. And one more note on label reading, some manufacturers often like to make their products look healthier than they are and will, for example, make what's obviously a single serving size bag contain two, sometimes three, or even four servings. So if you look on the label, it might look like a healthy small 10 gram carb snack, but it could be 40 grams for that teeny tiny little bag. Just be careful when reading the labels that you're really understanding what it is saying. Tip number two, don't drink your carbs. Recent estimates say the average American adult eats or drinks 17% of daily calories from added sugar. These are mainly in the form of sodas, sugary coffee drinks, fruit juices, and sports drinks. Now you may be avoiding soda and fluorescent blue Gatorade right now, but juice is definitely a trap that the health conscious can get stuck in. Unfortunately, without the fiber from fruits or veggies, these juices can get turned into sugar rather quickly in the body and can spike blood sugars. And even a small amount can be a problem. And if you needed another example of how it can really raise your blood sugar quickly, it's my type 1 diabetic son's first choice for getting out of a dangerously low blood sugar as quickly as possible. It seems to work even faster than candy makes you think. I will say though that some juices can be okay. If it's made with mainly low carb vegetables, then it doesn't seem to be all that bad. But unfortunately, many of those can taste like dirt. So to make them palatable, manufacturers and juice shops add fruit. Again, just pay attention to the ingredients and the labels. Also bad, going through your local Starbucks drive-thru and getting a vase sized cup of sugar posing as coffee. But you knew that, right? Tip number three, Try to always eat carbs with protein and fat. A carb by itself will typically turn into glucose in your body a lot faster than a carb paired with some protein and fat. You don't always have to have both protein and fat, but including these with a carb will help slow down the digestion and subsequent turning of carbs into sugar within the body. 
This often gives your pancreas time to pump out the correct amount of insulin as well, instead of just dumping a ton to try to cover everything, which then leads to low blood sugars, inflammation, and eventually insulin resistance. Some examples of these balanced meals, if you're in a gluten-free diet, would be a cup of wild rice, a piece of roast chicken, and an avocado cashew sauce. Or for a snack, a piece of gluten-free whole grain bread with an olive tapenade on top. If you're on the paleo diet, this might look like an almond and tapioca flour pancake with some eggs and bacon and some hazelnut butter smeared over the pancake. Or for a snack, an orange with a handful of macadamia nuts. And if you're doing the autoimmune paleo or AIP diet, this might look like a cup of diced roasted sweet potatoes with a piece of roasted chicken and a baked avocado. Or for a snack, an apple drizzled with some coconut butter. Tip number four is to pay attention to the glycemic index and the glycemic load. Now the glycemic index, or GI, gives a number from zero to 100 for how quickly a food will raise blood sugar. 100 is pure sugar. The lower a food's GI, the slower blood sugar will rise after eating it. However, this doesn't give the full story. Take watermelon, for example. Its GI is 80, which would make it a terrible food for blood sugar, right? Well, not so fast. Unless you're eating the whole dang watermelon, you're not getting very many carbs in a serving. It's actually only 6 grams of carbs per 120 grams serving, which isn't very many carbs at all. So even though it may raise your blood sugar quickly, it probably wouldn't raise your blood sugar a lot because there isn't that much sugar in the watermelon to turn into glucose in your body. So this is where the glycemic load comes into play. It factors in serving sizes and how much glucose you'll be eating from that serving. So for that watermelon, for example, it only has a GL of 4. On the other hand, take corn tortillas. The glycemic index is lower than watermelon at only 52, but the GL is higher than watermelon at 12 per a serving size of two tortillas. Carbs for that are 24 grams. So it will most likely have a bigger effect on your blood sugar than watermelon. Both of these numbers though can be helpful for balancing out meals. You wanna try not to have too many high GI or GL foods in one meal. And if you are suffering from a lot of high blood sugars, it may be helpful to see if eating lower GI and GL foods will help. The information for these can be found at the University of Sydney site, glycemicindex.com. Tip number five, quantity matters. Now high blood sugar and the associated symptoms come because you've eaten too many carbs for what your body can handle at that time. So naturally, this translates to making sure you don't overload your body with too many carbs at one time. This will be different for everyone. So it's something you'll have to experiment with. But for example, I learned that I can eat about a half cup of rice in a meal without it doing too much to my blood sugar. But more than that, I definitely noticed my blood sugar rising. Standard amounts of food in a meal though have crept up over the years. So it is definitely something to pay attention to. Plus there are only so many nutrients one can get from a food. And eating a half cup to a cup of a high carb food most likely will give you the nutrients that you need anyway. So focus more on varying things and having a smaller amount. And if you're still struggling with this, using a smaller plate can actually help quite a bit. Tip number six, exercise is important. Exercise has been proven in many studies to improve insulin sensitivity, which is what you want. It's the opposite of the undesired insulin resistance. Plus it also helps you to use up the glucose in your bloodstream after meals, because glucose is the primary fuel that the body uses. So exercise can be very helpful and an important part of your blood sugar control. Exercise, especially things like walking, can be extremely helpful right after a higher carb meal because it can help blunt any blood sugar spikes, making them not go as high or high for so long. A simple walk around the block after meals can be a wonderful way to control your blood sugar. However, the intensity and frequency of exercise also matter. This is something you'll need to play around with yourself, but high intensity exercise and too much exercise without adequate recovery can be stressors on your body. This in itself can raise blood sugars due to the release of the stress hormone cortisol. This isn't to say you can't do high intensity exercise, but do be mindful of what happens when you do and give yourself adequate recovery afterwards. If you're really tired, feel like you're walking through mud or don't wanna move, chances are you've done too much. So back off for a few days. If you do push through, chances are your body will produce cortisol in response, which will make your blood sugars rise as a result. Tip number seven, watch out for starchy grain-free flours. This one is mainly for those of you on the paleo and AIP diets, as it's very easy to get caught in the trap of, oh, it's a grain-free muffin, therefore it must be healthy. 
Just like in tip number one, where I said to be cautious of the grain-free packaged goods, you need to pay attention to what ingredients you're using to make your own baked goods, pancakes, waffles, muffins, etc. Even dairy-free cheese can be in this category. Many of these items on these diets are made with starchy and extremely high-carb flours like cassava, tapioca, and arrowroot. It's not that these flours are inherently bad and that you shouldn't eat them, but you need to pay attention to the quantity and frequency that you're eating them. If you're just replacing your morning pancakes with a cassava pancake, and then your lunch bread with a tapioca-based flatbread, and then your dinner is a cassava flour pasta, you're not doing yourself any favors with your blood sugar. Focus more on eating vegetables, high quality meat and seafood, healthy fats, and some fruits, rather than these comfort foods. It may be helpful to use a meal tracker like MyFitnessPal for a few days to see exactly how many carbs you're eating from these starchy flours. I know when I first did this, my eyes just about popped out of my head. It's just so easy to get lulled into thinking you're eating a completely healthy diet because it's labeled paleo or AIP or whatever. But remember, any diet can be turned into an unhealthy junk food diet. The junk food just might look a little different depending on what ingredients you eat. Tip number eight, reduce stress. Now this tip encompasses any stress on your body, not just the stress because you have a big deadline at the end of the week or your dishwasher just broke so you're facing a hefty repair bill. If you recall, the reason that high or low blood sugars are so bad for autoimmune disease is that they cause the body to release the stress hormone cortisol. And cortisol release tends to raise blood sugars. It's a bad cycle to get into. So by reducing the amount of cortisol your body produces because of stress will help keep your blood sugars in check. I know it's kind of cliche these days to say reduce stress, but it really is important. Stress relief doesn't even have to be the traditional things like meditation. Just finding a hobby that you enjoy, spending some time cuddling with a pet, or limiting the scary or dramatic TV shows you watch can be extremely helpful. Stressors other than the acute deadline or bill kind of stress can be things like lack of sleep, too much caffeine, too high intensity or too much of exercise, fasting or going for a long time without eating food, changing diets, food intolerances and allergies, extreme heat or cold, altitude, illness, and that can include acute things like the flu or a cold or chronic illness, and sugary foods before bed, especially if you wake up at 3 a.m. with some anxiety. Now some of these sometimes could be worth a short-term release of cortisol, like changing diets for instance. If you're on a terrible diet that isn't doing your body any favors, switching to a new one may release some cortisol for a short while until you and your body adjust, but then you'll be better off for it. It's worth it. And some may not affect you at all. For example, through all of my experimentation wearing a continuous glucose monitor, I have not once seen a correlation between me drinking coffee and high blood sugars. But I know of others whose blood sugars shoot right up and stay there after drinking a teeny tiny little cup. So again, everyone is highly individual and you should experiment to find out what affects you. Tip number nine, find your daily carbohydrate tolerance. Because we're all so individual, I can't give you out a blanket, do this diet or stick to this many carbs each day for blood sugar control. What I can say though, is that you'll most likely have a certain amount of carbs that you can tolerate before you start to feel symptoms from high blood sugars, like feeling like you'll have to take a nap after a meal or sugar cravings. As soon as you feel those, it probably means you've eaten too many carbs for what your body can handle. Unfortunately, if this happens multiple times each day, your blood sugars will more than likely raise and stay up at that higher level, never coming back down into a normal healthy range. This will also lead to insulin resistance and eventually type 2 diabetes. So to avoid this, you need to figure out a ballpark amount of carbs that you seem to be able to tolerate without symptoms and try not to go over that often or if at all. For some people, this may look like a ketogenic diet with less than 20 to 50 grams of carbs per day. For others like me, it might mean less than 150 grams of carbs a day. And for others still, you might be able to tolerate even more. Again, this is where tracking your meals for a few days or weeks with something like MyFitnessPal or your favorite tracking tool and using a glucometer or a continuous glucose meter to measure your blood sugars may be helpful to determine the actual numbers for you. I've found that if you stick to the tolerance or under, blood sugar comes back into and stays in a normal healthy range. It might not be your most favorite thing to do. I mean, after all, carbs tend to be associated with comfort, right? 
but I also think you can get away with eating some of these higher carb things that you want on an occasional basis, like for a special occasion or on a vacation. Once you figure out your carb tolerance, you may notice some pesky, hard to resolve symptoms go away as well though, like poor sleep, irritability, sugar cravings, and those midday energy crashes. So it could really be worth it. And tip number 10, don't just focus on blood sugar. Now sometimes blood sugar spikes can be worth it. Whether it's because there are nutrients in a high carb food that's hard to get anywhere else, or because certain carbs are a wonderful food for your gut microbiota, there are many reasons why eating some of these foods that will raise your blood sugars can actually be a good thing. Plus you're going to have times when you have special celebrations, vacations, and whatever else comes about where you'll want some of these sugary desserts or sentimental treats. You don't have to avoid these things completely. It's all about balance. Eat those particular foods with low carb foods so it's not so much all at once. Don't have them with every meal. Space it out. A blood sugar spike every so often is not going to have the same detrimental effect on your immune system and inflammation in your body that constant high blood sugars or several spikes a day will. So the bottom line is this. Enjoy life, but just keep an eye on how many times you're seeing your blood sugars go above normal or that you're feeling symptoms after meals. Because remember, the whole problem with this is that your body is producing stress hormones, which leads to inflammation and immune system dysregulation. So stressing over being perfect on your blood sugars is kind of counterproductive. So practice balance and do your best. Thank you so much for joining me and I will see you in the next video.